and um, her paper is Social Media Changing the World, How the New Media Advocates LGBT Rights. Thank you. Um, so in my presentation, I will talk more about the role of social media and also the limitation of opportunities of social media for LGBT activism. Um, today, social media are not only central tools for the formation work for the, for the LGBT and other social movements, but have also been accused of leading to a decline in media quality. Hence, I do not only want to talk about the opportunities brought by the new media forms, but also try to quickly discuss the limitations and also make recommendations on how we as LGBT social activists um, can ensure the quality in our media. In order to really understand the importance of media within the LGBT movement, let's br briefly look at um, LGBT media history. As we all know, Harry Hay was not only the founder of the first homophile organization, but he was also the first activists to really implement the media for gay activism. Um, after one of the Madison Society's members got um, arrested for dissolute behavior, um, the organization fought to convince the mainstream media to, to convince the public about his innocence. However, as we know, the mainstream media um, did not really respond to this request, and so um, the Madison Society became active by going out on the streets and distributing leaflets throughout Los Angeles to reach the public, which of course was very dangerous at this time. Um, after several years of grassroots activism, uh, Harry Hay and the Madison Society decided their own um, newsletter one, which, should, which uh, for the following decade should become the most important gay magazine. Um, one year later, uh, the Daughters of Abilities, the first lesbian organization, got started by uh, Phyllis Leon and Del Martin. Um, both um, started the organization, and one year later, they started um, publishing the lesbian newsletter, The Letter, which should become the first lesbian newsletter uh, dealing with social and political issues of lesbians, and should, which should also become one of the most important gay and lesbian newsletters to date. Um, throughout the next year, years, or throughout the next decades, both one and the letter reached gays and lesbians throughout the nation, across the country, really provided not only a space for um, social organization, but, but also for critical discussion of political and social gay and lesbian issues. Um, while well, uh, the social transformations of the 1960s and the Stonewall riots, of course, um, called for new and even more radical media activism, lesbians uh, soon started to separate from the gay movement. They really tried to um, start a separate movement to address their own social and political issues, and publications like The Lesbian Tide and The Furies became central publications for, for the new found lesbian movement. Within the two publications, um, lesbians discuss, discussed several political and social issues um, directly related to lesbians. For example, homophobia within the feminist movement, um, and discussed this across the nation. However, during the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, lesbian and gay individuals reunited to fight the, the national storm of homophobia. Oh, and while some media, mainstream media outlets like the Boston Globe or the Philadelphia Inquirer provided timely and se sensitive coverage, most mainstream media largely ignored the, gay, uh, the, the, the AIDS epidemic within the first years. The gay newspaper, the New York Native, was not only the first to talk about the disease, but was remained the most reliable source throughout the epidemic. As a response to the lack of political action, organizations like ACT UP organized media effective pro protests all across the nation to draw attention to the epidemic. Protests were also held against major newspapers like Cosmopolitan, 
or the Washington Press to challenge wrong information on HIV transmission. And um, if nothing else, the AIDS epidemic made gay men and lesbian women aware of, of the lack of recognition for their partnerships. Throughout the next decade, family issues like same-sex marriage and adoption became central issues for LGBT activism and the LGBT movement. Simultaneously, new media forms emerged that really brought new chances for LGBT activism. And so now I want to talk a little more about how new media can advocate for LGBT rights. Um, the media activism of social movements. A national survey by Harris Institute shows the, the significance for social media for LGBT individuals. According to the national sample, 54% of gay and lesbian individuals follow web blogs as compared to 40% of heterosexual blog readers. Further, 73% of lesbian women and gay men um, have a Facebook account as compared to only 65% of straight individuals. These numbers really show um, that social media have a central uh, place within the LGBT movement and should be utilized for LGBT activism to reach a broad constituency. As social media constantly change and develop, a definition is transformative rather than static. The new media forms, however, share the following characteristics. First of all, reach. Social actors are now able to reach global audiences beyond geographic borders. Accessibility. As communication tools are available at little or no cost, it is now easier for social actors to become both audience and publisher of media content. Next, usability. New media forms that do not require any special skills or training. Again, making it easier for individuals to become audience and publisher of media content at the same time. Recency and permanence. Media content can be instantly uploaded and responded to making it easier for social activists to connect internationally and keep up to date with the latest efforts. Today, several social media campaigns by LGBT organizations demonstrate the potential for social actors. For the same-sex marriage movement, for example, social media became the central tool to keep up to date with legalization efforts in other states and to organize nationally and internationally. The Californian organization Equality California, for example, was one of the first to post videos of same-sex couples and their allies speaking out about the importance of marriage equality. This really gave um, same-sex couples the chance to really like tell their personal stories and reach a broad constituency. Um, this interactive form of media activism was also implemented by the organization The Wedding Party here in New York and the national organization Freedom to Marry. Campaigns today also demonstrate that every LGBT activist can become an active social media activist without being affiliated with any organization. One example, and I guess most of us know the, um, the campaign, is um, the It Gets Better campaign by Dan Savage. Um, as a response to teen suicide across the nation, he asked LGBT individuals and allies to speak out um, for LGBT individuals and give hope. Today, uh, more than 30,000 have participated in the It Gets Better campaign, with President Obama being the most, I guess, the most famous participant. So um, now that we talked so much about the possibilities of social media for LGBT activism, how can we, as social media activists, ensure quality in the media? The increasing popularity of social media, foremost blogs, as alternative news sources have led to the discussion whether the new media forms led to a decline in media quality. For us as social media activists, it is central to think about these issues, as, this, as the success of our advocacy largely depends on our communication and information strategies. Social media expert Priya Shah makes the following recommendations to ensure quality in social media outlets. First and foremost, we need to take responsibility for our words and reserve to the right to restrict comments to our content that do not conform with basic civility standards. 
Second, we won't say anything that we wouldn't say in public. Third, if tensions escalate, we will connect privately before we do so publicly. Five, we do not allow anonymous comments. And last, we encourage blog posts to enforce more vigorously their terms of services. Violating these rules, we could not only hurt our reputation as journalists and social media activists, but also jeopardize the cause of the whole movement. As LGBT social media activists, we should also come up with a code of ethics, for example, that should designate web um, that should designate websites that meet certain journalistic criteria with a certificate of approval. Websites could also designate whether the publisher has an educational background in journalism or is a layman in publishing. While these are only a few suggestions on how to improve our work as social media activists, we also need to remember that LGBT activism goes beyond a like on Facebook or a tweet. While social media forms are effective tools to organize protests, we need not to forget uh, the importance to go out on the streets and to advocate for our cause. Thank you. I see that a, a real lack of, of opportunity by jumping onto Facebook, for instance. Um, you are giving up privacy in a big way and you're giving up the autonomy of designing your communications. Like you really have to fit things within the way that those media work. Um, but people like it. They like the fact that Facebook allows you to not only focus on you know, your core group, whoever that might be, but you can also immediately plug into talking to your coworkers, your family. Um, find out you know who's performing when and where uh, but it comes with a cost because like I said your, your privacy is gone you can't the things that you can do face to face you cannot do over the electronic media because everyone else is listening and if that's important to you it's important to you the fairies had the experience building a website that had, it was electronic media and it is something that someone else could be listening in to and I'm not paranoid. This does happen. Um, but at least we were it, on this, this web presence that we constructed, we could do things our own way. We could construct our communications and our imagery in a way that was meaningful to us. But it didn't fit into the rest of the, the, the way that people work. So it, it it stopped being used, and Facebook has taken over, and I think it's, it's, it's sad. Um, so I'm going to speak always against it in terms of building community within a, a group of people. Keith raises one good point, that people listen in. Uh, that is a negative. The other, the other negative, I think, is that there is still something uh, personal about, for instance, giving a, a piece of paper, giving a newspaper, a newsletter to somebody when you're trying to organize them. Uh, it's real easy to write in Facebook, and, and you need to use the social media because people are there. I mean, if you're going to organize, you go to where the people are. They're on the social media, so you have to go there. But it's also so easy to do that uh, everybody does it, and so you become overwhelmed, and, and uh, I think it loses a certain... Uh, it, it discourages people... From really coming together to be face to From really communicating. Yeah, I mean, you think you're communicating when you're, you're right out to your friends. I and mean, I've got 2,000 some friends on Facebook. I don't know who most of them are. Uh, you know, so, so uh, I'm going to have to rummage through it to find people I actually know to see what they're up to. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I joined Facebook and all of a sudden I got about 200 friend requests. <laughs> Ryan Wolnowski who has 30,000 unread emails. He, he's one of those, there are a lot of them around, that uses it to promote his stuff, doesn't pay any attention to anything that's posted, just uploads his stuff, and then but a lot of your friends are your friends because they want to invite you to their CD release party. They want you to come and hear them sing or play. Uh -huh. And uh, I, one thing I did want to raise as a different issue with what you said, which I really disagree with, and that was you were talking about controlling comments. Mm -hmm. I never, never want 
one time on Facebook I did because they said it was so anti-woman, a woman with a cross stuffed down her throat and it said the trouble with religion is they, they shove it down your throat. It was an anti-religion thing, not an anti-woman thing, but the transsexuals got so upset I did take it down. But if you go to the thing, Gay Russians March Proudly in New York City. I didn't know there was such a thing as Slav Pride. How many people said all the faggots should be killed? It was a, it, one video, I have 500 videos on YouTube. And that one video has gotten more vitriol and more hate. It's absolutely overwhelming to see the homophobia. The only other video that came close to it was Women's Rights, a worldwide horror show. And there what happened where the Arab men would come on and say, you, you Westerners are ruining our thing. But the point I'm making is that I feel I'm very opposed to censoring. Now there is a thing where they can put negative and if five people say negative, they hide it. I always click to see what's hidden. Because what, <laughs> no, because what it is, it's such a hate spew. You fucking faggot, you should be killed. I'm telling you, this is the kind of stuff and I put up with it all the time and I feel it speaks for itself. If someone comes on and says they should put all these people and burn them alive, I think that that really is a testimonial to the hate that's out there in the world. Can I get a lot of people that comment in that regard on this, that video? Yeah, see, I'm, I'm like, I'm all for free speech and I, I'm like, maybe I said it, like, framed it in the wrong way because I, I, I'm not talking about like censoring anyone, but I just feel if you like don't stop certain comments at a certain point, it can, especially like um, when it comes to blogs, it can like really hinder like the quality like of the blog and it can really like, jeopardize the whole social media outlet. So I just think you gotta like stop it somewhere if it gets too personal. Go ahead. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, there's a, a scholar named Helen Berger who does work on the, the witches in Massachusetts. And one of the things she points out is that for, for um, modern American pagans, the creating of rituals is as much a spiritual act as having the rituals. And what you just said reminded me of that, that the creating of the newsletter was as much an act of organizing and community activism as well, maybe not as much, but similarly powerful. I meant to dwell on that, but I, I kind of rushed through. But it's just an interesting observation Absolutely. throughout that community. Uh, um, the last really large kind of instantaneous queer demonstration that I remember happening in New York um, was prior to the internet. That was when Matthew Shepard was killed. And as a result of a phone tree, 5,000 people got out of the streets. And I was, as you were talking, I was trying to think, okay, you know, where is, where, where is the, the organizing leading to, uh, I'm interested in street action, where, where is the um, organizing leading to street action? And then I had the thought, oh, occupation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the occupation was, uh, you probably organized that way. I just wondered if you had any reflections on, you know, why it worked there and why it's not happening in the queer community, or I don't see it happening in the queer community. It's, it's, it's a really good question. I'm like, because I'm actually looking more into that kind of research right now, like where, where did we go, like really from street activism to like social media activism, mm -hmm. because you're definitely right, like people stop, like except for the, the Occupy movement, really uh, people really stop like going out on the streets and protesting for like what they believe in and that is like a really big issue and that's why I'm, I think I say like at the end of my presentation we should really take like social media outlets to organize protests but not like to only do like online protests because not everyone's gonna hear or see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah I think that somebody raised the issue I think you know there's so much chatter as well, that you know, it's like it's hard to focus yeah. in. And, you know, whereas when you get a phone call from somebody, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a friend, you know that. You know that. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a couple comments. Uh, one is how this country has been dragged gradually more and more to the right, and so um, and and the queer community has become, um, besides becoming almost one issue about marriage rather than, let's say, homeless queer youth or uh, getting the uh, economic, uh, the, the end of the, end of the uh, Economic Non-Discrimination and Employment Act passed. 
um, things that uh, affect poor working class people, um, that's kind of all forgotten for the moment. And I've even talked to young people who think the LGBT uh, movement started with marriage equality and the like. But anyway, um, just want to make some comments about the early history. When uh, One Magazine and The Ladder came out, it was against the law to mail, in the US mails, anything that was considered to be pornography, even though there was no discussion of sex acts, no photographs, it was a they were political and uh, intellectual papers. And uh, one magazine actually went to court to be able to uh, legally send their magazine around the country. And they were in court, I think, four or five years. They worked their way all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And they won in 1957. And the first, per the first people to use the new law were the publishers of Lady Chatterley's Lover in England. They were able to ship it to the United States. And then one magazine became the second people to use it. <laughs> so we, we take a lot for granted. Um, also, I think I, I would never, I'm very eccentric. I won't use Facebook. They also have facial recognition technology, uh, which picture a President Santorum and being able to like go in and his administration being able to go in and identify us all by what we look like. I mean, it's, and, and also it's not just commodifying the queer community, it's commodifying the entire world almost. I mean, they've got a billion, almost a billion people. Um, and that is, that is the other thing. And the, and the other thing about the, the mainstream assimilated queer community is that um, it is so corporate orientated. The LGBT pride parades are corporate sponsored and cost a million dollars. I mean, the, the $1.8 million for the San Francisco one, why does it cost $1.8 million? to put on, what they're putting on is a parade. They're not putting on a gay liberation march. I mean, my my first one in Chicago in 72, we were chanting, two, four, six, eight, smash the family, church, and state. I mean, it's really turned around into this mild tame. We want to have our white picket fence and get married and raise children. And I really don't think that is what our innate natures are about. And then I, I just wanted to say about Australia, I don't know if you've ever seen Hope Along the Wind, the movie about Harry Hay, done by Eric Slade, who's here at the convention. But the, the movie got its name from a letter that Harry Hay got uh, in Australia, uh, from Australia saying, we know that the kind of work you're doing in California will never be done in Australia. We know that there will never be any opportunity for us to express ourselves here in Australia. But but reading about what you're doing comes across the ocean like a breath of fresh air and hope along the wind. And, he, and they were wrong about uh, they were wrong about Australia. They? <laughs> <laughs> they were luckily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued because I'm actually writing a book chapter about that right now and how. Uh, lesbians communicated before the internet, and uh, one of the more effective things that I remember happening was about media visibility when um, Heartbeat, a very obscure TV show, had a lesbian nurse as a character introduced temporarily, and um, my friends, uh, we all phoned each other, did you know, watch it next week, there was no other way to find out about it, it was a program introduced during the writer's strike in Hollywood, it was only on for like, you know, eight weeks. TV Guide had a tiny line that they had been receiving hostile mail from nurses objecting to a lesbian nurse character. But they listed the name of the show's producer. And I sent her $10 in cash from my little grad student savings account, saying, I don't know any other way to get a hold of you, but use this to publicize the good work you're doing. And she phoned me, the producer, uh, who's um, uh, also a very well-known author. And uh, she called and said, if you and your friends really want to help keep my show on the air, here's what you do. So this was direct action because of a phone tree and writing a letter and then a, a personal phone call and so forth. And um, it's very instructive to me because I, I feel my students expect instant uh, ease of knowledge and answer within half an hour either for me or somebody else. So I don't know how to, um, you know, without telling lots of stories in my classes,
impress upon my students what it was like to do treasure hunts as an activist to draw attention to gay issues and that that was a big part of fostering visibility. You did the footwork and the phone work. It didn't all come instantly. But it was very successful, the phone tree. Thank you for saying telephone tree. <laughs> To go back to what we were talking about earlier about the hate speech and the internet and censoring it, uh, I think the internet has been very, it's very important to, to see that on the internet because we see the magnitude of the hate that is out there that we otherwise wouldn't see. People think we are becoming more tolerable society towards, towards a homophobia and racism and whatnot, but on the internet we can really see that. That's on the internet. We can see that so we can see that, hey, there's a lot more work that. I just wanted to respond to this issue of etiquette at a certain level. You know, that uh, people have pointed out when the phone first came out, nobody knew there was no etiquette developed around it. So you didn't really know how to get on the phone and off the phone and interrupt each other. It was a mess and it had to develop over time. And I think there's some, I agree with about the censorship in terms of general things. But if you're community organizing and you're working with other people, you have to develop some sense, just like you would in person. If you were if we were sitting here having a meeting and somebody was ranting like that, we would respond, or there would be an expectation. It would be clear that that's out of line. And so I think it's important to create domains and not have a one size fits all kind of a thing, right? Like there's places for public expression, but there's also a need for civility and etiquette so that people can be heard. And, and that you feel, I don't want to say safe, I hate that word, but that you feel respected <laughs> as you're respecting others. So I, I just think it's about domains and what's the yeah. project of that media. Could I why don't, why don't we get some ask one more question? It seems to me that the it isn't just an issue of etiquette, but when you see, I'll take an issue, say documentation or a, a video about bullying, about some kid committing suicide, or that type of thing. It is very effective because it makes people mad. People see the injustice. And so therefore, something that actually is an act of hate captured on video becomes a great organizing tool. And I'll use the greatest example of all of the R. Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant did more to build the gay LGBT movement in the United States than any other living person. <laughs> Period. Because she got everybody so damn mad <laughs> that they, they got <laughs> active. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> did you guys want to respond? Or did you put something to... No, he's absolutely right about Anita Bryant. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm like, you're definitely right, we got to show this stuff, we've got to show the hate, but like coming from a, from the side of a um, social activist, like from a social media activist, and if you work for an LGBT organization, you also got to think about issues like journalistic standards, and um, then you got to think about, okay, so in how far, or what kind of language do I allow um, to respond to my content that, that's out there. And I feel like that should be in the hands of like every individual who's put, putting like their content out there. And oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, please, please. Comments are like letters to the editor, they're just a, a, a modern version of letters to the editor, mm -hmm. and they were always curated and edited. And so, um, and the reason you did that was that you wanted to get a variety of points of view. And you wanted to make sure that you know one person wasn't dominating the airspace, um, and I think the same principles are, are what we're suggesting in online space as well. That you moderate and edit. There was um, there was some articles about Lawrence Brose when he was arrested in Buffalo and and accused of possessing child pornography in a Buffalo newspaper. And it, the newspapers are now because they're hooked into electronic media allowing people to respond and leave their comments. And people do it so casually and you know, so hideously that this newspaper decided 
they weren't going to censor, but they were going to require that people identify themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it cut down the bullshit <laughs> incredibly. So I think it's a dynamic uh, event, the way people express mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you mind if I said a couple words about the electronic project? Um, if you came in after my talk, uh, you, you might have missed the, the flyer that went around. I hope you'll get a copy of it. Uh, what I'm doing now is, is uh, I'm involved in a uh, project to digitize the underground and alternative papers from the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, we, we love those papers and now we think they're all gone, but the fact is they're not gone. Uh, librarians are the original uh, pack, not, you know, pack rats. Uh, they were saving all the papers as fast as we were putting them out. And they exist now still on the, on, the, on the dusty shelves of the special collections libraries. People don't read them anymore because they're out of the way. They don't know about them, but they're there. Uh, but they're inaccessible, and they're also getting older. They're getting yellowed, and they're beginning to decay. So what we're trying to do is, is digitize as many of these papers as we can. But it involves us finding people who are, will be seen as the rights holders of these papers. You can't just digitize and put it out there without getting permission. Uh, even though we wrote them without thinking of copyright, the fact is someone or some group can't claim the right. So we're trying to find who those people are uh, and get the permission. So what I'm looking for, what I'm asking for, is, and what the flyer talks about, is if you were part of any of those papers, or if you know anybody who was, please get in touch with me. I've got a, a sheet here that you can uh, you know, give me your contact information so we can talk, but please do get in touch with me. Uh, we've got a, on the flyer you see the list of the women's and uh, the feminist and lesbian papers that are on board. Uh, lesbian Tide and, and the Furies, which, which uh, uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, they're on board already. Conditions, which is a paper that Cheryl Clark mentioned uh, earlier, that's on board already. She, in fact, personally gave me permission. But we're looking for a lot more, and the gay papers we're just getting started on. We hardly have any of those Good. yet. So uh, anyhow, I'd, I'd love the names. Could, and, and, uh, could, I, could I make a very important suggestion? Uh, I was in, I was recently inducted into the uh, Lesbian and Gay Journalist Hall of Fame in Las okay. Vegas. I was the first person to demonstrate. I got screw busted. Uh, the text of Live and Let Live was published in Paul Krausner's uh, magazine as well as a profile of me as a titbook editor. And one thing I found out recently making a, a documentary about Marsha P. Johnson is this damn copyright issue. I would urge every writer, and I told my, my executor, upon my death, every email, everything about my life is in the public domain. Because if you die, you think, well, I don't have any family. Well, you know, if you die and you have a homophobic brother, he inherits it or something, exactly. and it's never available at all. So I think it's something that gay people particularly that are involved in activism, like the people you're talking about, that start spreading and promoting the idea of having a a, you know, declaration in their will that all my writings go into public domain because some things got buried for 150 years. Absolutely. Great. I'd like so, to talk to you later on. So mm -hmm. please, please join me in thanking Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant did more to build the gay LGBT movement in the United States than any other living person. <laughs> Period. Because she got everybody so damn mad that they, they got active. I'm like, you're definitely right, we gotta show this stuff, we gotta show the hate, but like coming from a, from the side of a um, social activist, like from a social media activist, and if you work for an LGBT organization, you also gotta think about issues like journalistic standards, and um, then you gotta think about, okay, so in how far, or what kind of language do I allow um, to respond to my content that, that's out there, and I feel like that should be in the hands of like every individual who's put, putting like their content out there. And oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, so please, comments please. are like letters to the editor. They're just a, a, a modern version of letters to the editor, and they were always curated and edited. And so, um, and the reason you did that was that you wanted to get a variety of points of view. 
and you wanted to make sure that you know one person wasn't dominating the airspace. Um, and I think the same principles are, are what we're suggesting in online space as well, that you moderate and edit. There was um, there were some articles about Lawrence Bros when he was arrested in Buffalo and, and accused of possessing child pornography in a Buffalo newspaper. And it, the newspapers are now, because they're hooked into electronic media, allowing people to respond and leave their comments. And people do it so casually and you know, so hideously that this newspaper decided they weren't going to censor, but they were going to require that people identify themselves. Mm -hmm. It cut down the bullshit <laughs> incredibly. So I think it's a dynamic uh, event, the way people express mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you mind if I said a couple words about the electronic project? Um, if you came in after my talk, uh, you might have missed the, the flyer that went around. I hope you'll get a copy of it. Uh, what I'm doing now is, is uh, I'm involved in a, a project to digitize the underground and alternative papers from the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, we love those papers and now we think they're all gone, but the fact is they're not gone. Uh, librarians are the original uh, pack, not, you know, pack rats. Uh, they were saving all the papers as fast as we were putting them out. And they exist now still on the, on the, on the dusty shelves of the special collections libraries. People don't read them anymore because they're out of the way, they don't know about them, but they're there. Uh, but they're inaccessible, and they're also getting older, they're getting yellowed, and they're beginning to decay. So what we're trying to do is, is digitize as many of these papers as we can. But it involves us finding people who are, will be seen as the rights holders of these papers. You can't just digitize and put it out there without getting permission. Uh, even though we wrote them without thinking of copyright, the fact is someone or some group can't claim the right. So we're trying to find who those people are uh, and get the permission. So what I'm looking for, what I'm asking for, is what the flyer talks about, is if you were part of any of those papers, or if you know anybody who was, please get in touch with me. I've got a, a sheet here that you can uh, you know, give me your contact information so we can talk, but please do get in touch with me. Uh, we've got a, on the flyer you see the list of the women's and uh, the feminist and lesbian papers that are on board. Uh, Lesbian Tide and, and the Furies, which, which uh, uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, they're on board already. Conditions, which is a paper that Cheryl Clark mentioned uh, earlier, that's on board already. She, in fact, personally gave me permission. But we're looking for a lot more, and the gay papers were just getting started on. We hardly have any of those yet. So, uh, anyhow, I'd, I'd love names. Could, and, and, uh, could, I, could I make a very important suggestion? Uh, I, was in, I was recently inducted into the uh, Lesbian and Gay Journalist Hall of Fame in Las okay. Vegas. I was the first person to demonstrate. I got screw busted. Uh, the text of Live and Let Live was published in Paul Krausner's uh, magazine as well as a profile of me as a tip book editor. And one thing I found out recently making a, a documentary about Marsha P. Johnson is this damn copyright issue. I would urge every writer, and I told my, my executor, upon my death, every email, everything about my life is in the public domain. Because if you die, you think, well, I don't have any family. Well, you know, if you die and you have a homophobic brother, he inherits it or something, exactly. and it's never available at all. So I think it's something that gay people particularly that are involved in activism, like the people you're talking about, that start spreading and promoting the idea of having a, a, you know, declaration in their will that all my writings go into public domain because some things got buried for 150 years. Absolutely. Right. I'd like so, to talk to you later on. So mm -hmm. please, please join me in thanking